Hey, everybody, this is Guy from Chit Chat. Thank you so much for listening. We are, I think, pushing 30 episodes. You'll know what it is because the number on your, on your screen tells you what it is, but this has been such a fun journey of learning about our community, highlighting stories and voices of, of people in our community. Um, so I'm, we're just thankful. I'm thankful that you are listening. I'm thankful that you're here and that this community is growing. From the inception of uh, the idea of, I want to do a podcast called Chit Chat, um, Miss Kelly, our guest today, was uh, one of the first people on the list that I wanted to talk to. I'm excited for you to hear this conversation. We got to talk about dyslexia and about how she helped my family by diagnosing Lucy, by helping me understand that I have dyslexia and understanding the, for sure, the challenges that come with dyslexia and, and how to kind of overcome them and also about the, the strengths uh, that come with dyslexia. Raising Lucy uh, has been such a joy and being able to, to do that in light of knowing her dyslexia um, has been just a, a, a treat. And so I'm excited for you to hear um, more about uh, Miss Kelly. Yeah, this is a really fun podcast for me to do, and I'm just excited for you to hear it now. Thank you so much for listening. Miss Kelly, thank you so much for coming and joining us on the podcast. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I am really excited. I'm really, really excited about having you on. Miss Kelly is an expert in dyslexia. And so I... I got to know Miss Kelly uh, when we realized that there's a chance that Lucy had dyslexia and just that process of learning about dyslexia with Lucy uh, and that's how I got to know you and I, I love learning in general. I love learning. I also love random facts and so like something to like learn about is fun for me and it just felt like this whole new world of, of things to learn about and uh, you were so gracious and so kind with Lucy and that process was really, really special. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but would you maybe just kind of like tell us who you are? To, I'd love to hear a little bit about your role at St. Cloud State, but but really I'd like, I'd love to hear about uh, your practice and how you, how you help people and what you do. Wonderful. Well, thanks again for having me. So a little bit about me. I, I did grow up in the St. Cloud area. Uh, my husband and I live on an organic farm now in Cold Spring. Mm. Um, we've been there for like 20 years, but I completed a 33-year teaching career in special education for Sartell St. Stephen School District. And so now I, I do work for Stride Academy half-time and adjunct faculty for St. Cloud State and also run my dyslexia business. And I have an office in Cold Spring and an office in St. Cloud. Mm -hmm. I went to St. Cloud State as an undergraduate and got my undergraduate in special education. I have my master's in special education from St. Cloud State and my doctorate in educational mm -hmm. leadership and administration from St. Cloud State as well. And I did my dissertation on dyslexia and parents' perspective of uh, abilities to accommodate for dyslexia in public school, private school, and homeschool learning mm -hmm. environments. Mm -hmm. So until, I don't know, maybe it was a year ago, 18 months ago, what I would have told you, because I didn't know anything about dyslexia, I would have said, oh yeah, I think dyslexia is where you see the letters backwards or you read the word backwards. You know, like it was, it was a pretty crude mm -hmm. uh, understanding of it. Would you maybe just like, just tell us, what, what is dyslexia? And then maybe we'll talk a little bit about like how you can spot it and, what, and, sure. and how you can find it. So the reading words backwards is really a myth and that a lot of people think that. And if that were really true, and what you could do is just put the book up to the mirror, mm. and then you'd be able to read it, and then you would be fine, be right? So that is a myth. I really like the definition of dyslexia as an unexpected weakness in a sea of strengths. Hmm. And so it's somebody that's really talented all the way around. But reading, writing, and or spelling are difficult, hmm. and it's the way the brain is wired, and it's it's phonological processing and the brain's ability to process language. Yeah. Will you remind me and, and tell us, what are some of the statistics around dyslexia? It's estimated that how, what, what percentage of our country has dyslexia right. in, some, in some version or form? There's uh, quite a bit of research out there on the prevalence of dyslexia, but you can really say 15 to 20 percent of the population mm. has some form of dyslexia, and it really goes on a spectrum of mild, moderate, severe, profound. Yeah. But even if you would go with like 10 percent, 12 percent, you know, we're talking about one out of 10 people. Yeah. So it's not rare at all. Right. And then if you have dyslexia, it's all it's. It's hereditary, right? It is very genetic. And so what, and what's the likelihood of passing it down to your offspring? 
So if there's one parent with dyslexia, there is like a 50% chance hmm. that you will have a child with dyslexia. If two parents have dyslexia, it is almost a given. Hmm. And it is so genetic that it runs in families. Hmm. And so we're really looking at warning signs of dyslexia when we look at, um, should we look at a full diagnosis? But one of those warning signs is a genetic link sure. because it's that strong of a genetic link. So if there's a sibling or a parent that has it, you, your, your, little, your little flag goes off to know right. to, to look in yep. deeper here. Cousins as well. And mm. there is about a 40% coexisting condition with attention deficit. Mm. So if you have a child or you know of someone that has attention deficit and they are struggling with reading, writing, and spelling as well, they probably have dyslexia mm. too. Hmm. Interesting. So I think the interesting thing about learning about dyslexia was we, we learned about it through Lucy, who happened to be a podcast guest. Um, and, you know, Cassie and I, as, as we were learning or as we were helping her read, um, it was one of those things that kind of like slowly crept up. You know, like at the beginning, everyone who doesn't know how to read, it's, it's mm -hmm. challenging to learn mm -hmm. to read. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you realize like, I, th I think it should have gone faster. Oh, but everybody's different. And mm -hmm. so it kind of like, it sneaks up, up on you kind of mm -hmm. slow. And I had this realization pretty deep into the reading process. Like, I think there might be more here. Mm -hmm. And then it, then I had to approach, uh, you know, kind of approach or broach that with Cassie mm -hmm. and say like, hey, have you been noticing any of this? And she was like, oh, I have. And so that's how that's how we ended up mm -hmm. meeting you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the fascinating thing that I that we got to learn about in in this this process was actually and you even said it in your definition, the inside of Sea of Strengths was that all of the kind of incredible giftedness that kind mm -hmm. of comes with people mm -hmm. with dyslexia at mm -hmm. times, I now think that rather than Lucy being seven or whatever it was when we're kind of like, oh, I think, I think there's something that she's, she's working through here. I think now I could spot it in her when she's a two-year-old mm -hmm. or a three-year-old mm -hmm. because of the things that she was really strong in. And mm -hmm. still, she's such a remarkable human being. Would you maybe unpack a little bit of that for us? Like, what are some of the strengths that you can see in people with dyslexia? Mm -hmm. And then maybe how does that kind of relate to what some of those, those uh, challenges are? Sure. So with dyslexia, they will have superior strengths in one of many areas. But creativity, people skills, looking at things like outside of the box, mm. they're often artistic, athletic uh, the mechanical ability, the ability to see math in their head, mm. uh, the way math fits together is often a strength, all those spatial awareness kinds of things. There are three careers that are full of people with dyslexia. Entrepreneurs, people that have their own businesses, engineers, mm. because they tend to see those math strengths in their head, and artists, visual artists, musicians fall into a category, but they say about 45 to 50% of everybody in the field is dyslexic. Mm. And it does come with challenges, but behind every successful dyslexic is somebody in their corner mm. that helps them get there. Yeah, really, really sweet. And so I think that was one of the unique things about coming and, and going through the testing with Lucy, and mm -hmm. it, it really has become kind of a, a full family thing. And, and really, my wife carries a bunch of, you know, a, a lot more of that. We, home, mm -hmm. we homeschool. And mm -hmm. um, so much of what of what this education even has been has been educating Cassie, too, on how, okay, so, so Lucy's brain, she's just wired a little different. Mm -hmm. And some of the traditional ways that we approach education mm -hmm. are, are not really meant for mm -hmm. Lucy or, or people with dyslexia. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Now that we know that, mm -hmm. how do we navigate still needing to learn those disciplines mm -hmm. in a way that really works for mm -hmm. Lucy. And so a whole bunch of that education was for Cassie too. Mm -hmm. And I'm so thankful. I mean, Cassie's wonderful in so many ways, but she has a degree in elementary ed, so she mm -hmm. kind of understands that and was mm -hmm. excited about it. Um, but it's been really sweet to kind of do that all together mm -hmm. as a family, you know, for Cassie to like really embrace, like, all right, I've got, I've got one kid who is really traditionally academic. Mm -hmm. And you can hand them a book and say like, I want you to read it, give me a report and, mm -hmm. and that whatever that, you know, that thing. And then we've got a, a, another kid that is not wired like that at all. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I'm gonna be real honest, I think I'm the kind of person who before learning about this, I would have thought that in school, some of the accommodations that we give people and, and give students and kids were soft. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think I could have had a, Kind of a, a kind of drivenness that, mm -hmm. especially with a lack of understanding about what's actually mm -hmm. happening here, that I would have said like, oh, it's just kids that don't want to work hard or something. Mm -hmm. You know, like again, mm -hmm. this is 
this is even a little embarrassing to say, but like I, I think it's honest about where I was. And then realizing and understanding if the goal of a test is to accurately source information that exists mm -hmm. inside of a person, mm -hmm. but we give the test to them in a way that they can't understand. Let's just say like you ask, like somebody doesn't speak any Spanish and mm -hmm. you ask them the question, what's two plus two, but you ask it to them in Spanish and they don't speak Spanish. They can't actually, they can't tell you what the mm -hmm. answer is because you've asked it in a kind of way that doesn't allow them to show the thing that's actually inside mm -hmm. of them. But by understanding dyslexia and maybe providing information and, and, and testing in a way that kids can understand it better that mm -hmm. have dyslexia, their incredible intellects are able to shine. Mm -hmm. And so that has been a fascinating thing to mm -hmm. learn. This is a unique thing. Like I'm talking about my kid, you know, but like we, we talk about this at home and she, she's not shy about it, but you know, we had this, this big standardized or this big test, you know, homeschoolers have to do this test. And it was just this question of like, we're curious on how, how will she do? Um, and she did so, she did so, we were so proud of her. She did so good. Mm -hmm. We had to, we had to accommodate how she received the information in the test. Mm -hmm. But by accommodating her, by Cassie reading her the questions, mm -hmm. right? And then her answering the questions verbally, she was able to highlight the, the intelligence that's there. And she scored really high mm -hmm. on everything mm -hmm. with the exception of, I forget what the specific category was, but it was something in relationship to reading and comprehension. Correct, right. And then she scored really, really poorly because there, there's no way, like she had to do that mm -hmm. one in the traditional way. Right. And she scored really poorly. But we're working on that, aren't we? But we are. Oh yeah, we're absolutely <laughs> working on it. But the thing is like, if, mm -hmm. if we just forced her, if mm -hmm. we just forced her to take the test in the kind of way that showed that she wasn't good at that one thing, mm -hmm. all, of the, all of the test results would have been really, really low. Mm -hmm. And we would, be, we would be under false, we'd be, we would have a, we'd have a false understanding of what intelligence actually exists inside of her. And so I think that's one of the things that's been really mm -hmm. freeing for us is like, oh man, and not just for Lucy, but just in general, like mm -hmm. providing information in a kind of way that humans of any kind can, can understand it mm -hmm. is that should really be the goal so that people can shine and show the intelligence they have. So this, this process of learning about dyslexia with Lucy has been really, right. really fascinating. I think a good example of that is maybe you've got a third, fourth, fifth grader taking a social studies or a science mm. test, and they're reading that test to themselves. Mm. You're not really measuring if the child has dyslexia. You're not measuring do they know social studies or right. science. You're measuring can they read. Mm. So that's not the point of the test. Of that read, test. read that social studies or science yeah. test to them. They're going to tell you the answer, yeah. and they know the material. The reading test is mm -hmm. meant to determine if they can read or not, but the but the social studies test is not mm -hmm. meant for that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Right. Fascinating. So how many how many years have you been working in dyslexia and with dyslexic people? Right. So I I became a certified dyslexia testing specialist in 2007. Okay. So I've really been working on diagnosing and working with families, doing tutoring. I came up with this model that I call my co-coaching model that Cassie and Lucy are mm -hmm. doing because there's just so many hours in the day. So if you have a willing parent or grandparent or family member that is willing to be the main reading coach, a little bit of support goes a long way yeah. with the right kind of program. And yep. they're getting they're getting a reading, writing, and spelling instruction um, in an Orton-Gillingham program. They chose the Barton Reading and Spelling Program. That's my favorite mm -hmm. as well. And it's just rock solid. It was originally designed for homeschool parents that couldn't find an Orton-Gillingham tutor. So that's um, with the right kind of program, the right kind of support, the sky is the limit. Yeah. The things that Lucy is good at, the things that she, it's remarkable. And now watching her, again, it, you know, they're, they're, it's still... It's not easy for her, but the progress that she's made doing Barton and having, mm -hmm. having mom really mm -hmm. in her corner, understanding mm -hmm. this, it's been incredible to mm -hmm. watch her, to watch her kind of thrive mm -hmm. in this thing. Another unique thing when you're dealing with a, a dyslexic kiddo is it, it actually helps in your, in some of your parenting and maybe even how you approach discipline. There are times when Cass and I will have a conversation about like, was that she'll call or we'll talk at the end of the day when I get home and she'll tell me about a situation. And the question is, do we think this was disobedience or do we think that this mm -hmm. was dyslexia? Because mm -hmm. what we found is if we send Lucy up to a room to go and clean and we give her a mm -hmm. whole bunch of instructions, mm -hmm. like I want you to do this, 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 mm -hmm. this, this, and this, and this, the likelihood of her 
being successful with that big giant list that you've sent her up with is is poor. Mm -hmm. There's there's a there's not a strong likelihood mm -hmm. that we are going to have success in, mm -hmm. in that thing. But if you send her upstairs with one specific goal, mm -hmm. she can be really, really successful mm -hmm. with that. Now, it's possible because she's a little kiddo that she could she also has the ability to be defiant, as we all do. Mm -hmm. But before that, the outcome of not cleaning your room just to a mom and dad that maybe don't know, it mm -hmm. just looks like defiance. Mm -hmm. If we sent James up to his room to go and do those five things and we went up there an hour later or 20 minutes later and nothing was done, the likelihood is pretty good that it would be defiance for him because he's... Mm -hmm. he, he's a traditionally academic mm -hmm. kid where lists and mm -hmm. hierarchy of mm -hmm. needs and uh, tasks mm -hmm. come very easily to him. So I think for him, we would have relative certainty that he's showing us some defiance. Mm -hmm. And with Lucy, it's just not the case. It's just, and so like understanding that mm -hmm. inside of her dyslexia has helped us parent way better too. So mm -hmm. I'm thankful to you. I'm thankful for the ability to like, not, not only through this diagnosis and some of this good tutoring and all this stuff, she's, I think, Academically, she is doing much, much better. But like w our relationship is better mm -hmm. because we know how to approach her mm -hmm. in relationship to mm -hmm. even just everyday tasks, mm -hmm. which is such a relief for us and I'm sure lots of other yeah. moms and dads trying to do the best for kids. And I think too to understand that often with dyslexia, they don't tend to be natural organizers mm -hmm. and they don't like to put things away. Mm -hmm. They like to pile things up. They like to keep things in view because Are they don't want to... Are you room right now? <laughs> yeah. that could or my workbench? Be. Yeah. <laughs> because they're afraid they're going to forget about something. Sure. So they want to put it away because mm -hmm. they might forget. Yeah. So they want to keep everything in view. It's kind of calming for them. Mm -hmm. And for someone else, they might think, well, this person doesn't want to put things away. Right. Could you share uh, maybe a story or two in your, I guess, nearly 20 years in the dyslexia space? Could you share, uh, you know, a story or two sure. just that are so sweet and so positive that maybe kind of highlights some of the strengths that you mm -hmm. see in dyslexic people and if, if people at the right time kind of get support in the right way, what they can kind of mm -hmm. overcome. Well, my first story I'll share is that I have an adult student right now and that it's never too late. Huh. So I had a friend who went to a garage sale of someone or the other way around and this friend doesn't mind if I talk about her, but she's like in her early 70s, her name is Sandy, and they got started discussing things and found out that Sandy never learned how to read. Hmm. And so my friend who works for the Sartell School District and in Intervention says, I think I know somebody that can help you. Hmm. And so now we are in level five of the Barton program. Hmm. There's 10 levels. And we had to start off at a level to improve auditory discrimination for Sandy called Foundation and Sounds. But it will be, we're coming up on a year together. Hmm. And so we do two hours a week and we have a nice little trade of services. Hmm. Uh, she'd never finished high school. She went back and got her GED at 60. And now mm. she is on her way to be a reader. Mm. And she never knew that it was dyslexia. And she just thought she wasn't smart enough. Sure. And this has opened up a whole world for her. Because there's been a lot of jobs. She has amazing strengths, as you know, come with dyslexia. But there have been things that she turned down where she could have got like a promotion mm -hmm. or moved up because she knew there would be reading involved. She knew that she'd be facing things that she didn't hmm. know how to do and didn't want to admit. And so she missed that. out on stuff. And so she said, no, thank you. I'll pass. Mm. I'm happy with what I'm doing. Hmm. And so now she is feeling so much better. And I said, give me another year and you're going to be feeling so oh, great. That's sweet. Yeah. I'm guessing when you start at 70 and someone mm -hmm. says, I think I can help you read. I'm guessing there's probably some thoughts in the back of your mind like, yeah, best of luck. You know, I'm, I'm 70 mm -hmm. years into this yes. and I've never been able to read before. So mm -hmm. like, you're not going to be able to help mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that has been really sweet to help her overcome some yeah. of that. Yeah, that has been really, really great. Uh, just some other stories are there students that have had, uh, or, you know, that have dyslexia, that have got tutoring, that have got accommodations in college, but they need to get accommodations for something like the nursing boards mm. and things that they have in college. And so I've had a number of students from St. Ben's who I have tested that have got extended time on the nursing boards, have passed, and now they are helping others. Mm. And it didn't make the test any easier but it allowed them to read through the questions a few more times, yep. lowered that anxiety. And so that ability to get an accommodation 
is just a domino effect of yeah. helping others, mm -hmm. where we need these creative, intelligent, empathetic people mm -hmm. in these fields. That's sweet. And what's been something that has kind of like caught you off guard about dyslexia or about your time tutoring dyslexic people? I think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of research on dyslexia, but a lot of times the behaviors that are being shown by students tend to come around and get better. Mm. As soon as they understand that this mm. isn't something else that somebody else mm. said they could help, this is working and it will work and then there's that trust level mm. and then you get these students that were described from other people as, you know, they really have emotional behavior disorders or something like that. It's a mental health issue, but you get them the right kind of help mm. and things get better. And it's mm. almost like a switch has turned. And small wins is a real deal mm -hmm. in life, just in general, mm -hmm. you know, like getting a small win under your belt helps you tackle that next thing. And so like you put a few, you know, you string a few of those things together. Mm -hmm. And I could imagine that behavior, mm -hmm. of course, behavior mm -hmm. is going to improve mm -hmm. or has the possibility right. of improving on the other side of that. They're so talented. They are going to get good at something. Mm. And it should be something that's positive. Right. And being the class clown mm. or, you know, maybe being good at kind of working around and getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. That could be something they could get very mm. good at. And if you can be on their side and that they can see that this can get better and that they don't have to hide, they don't have to cover up, they don't have to try to be somebody that they're not, Yeah. it goes a long way. Mm. How often are you in public you're at a restaurant talking to a server or you're sitting at a bonfire with friends and you're just talking to someone and you kind of realize like, oh, there are some tendencies here mm -hmm. and they're completely undiagnosed. Like how, how often just in your normal life do you come across people that you think, oh, mm -hmm. there's a decent chance that you have dyslexia? All the time. Okay. Yeah. It happens yeah. all the time. And I think that once the word gets out there and people understand how genetic it is, mm -hmm. That is really the light bulb going on for people, and that makes sense. And then they start to talk to other family members, and I think people uh. that are on the right track, that are finding solutions for themselves and for their kids, of things get better, they are more than happy to share their story yeah. with people. And if they hear anybody with a similar concern, they're like, have you considered? Mm -hmm. Have you considered? And it's life-changing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I shared this at, at one point in one of the other podcasts, but... In, in the process of getting Lucy tested and diagnosed and all of that stuff, you know, we had a few meetings with you. And at the first one, I was like, oof, some of these questions she's asking, like this hits really close to home. And then mm -hmm. the second one, I was like, oh, this hits really close to home. But I didn't say anything yet because it was like, well, like I have a job and a career and mm -hmm. like things are okay. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not here for me and we're, mm -hmm. we're trying to get this figured out with Lucy. Mm -hmm. But it was... I, the last time we were together and we were going through all of the Lucy's test results and mm -hmm. you were showing like, these are the areas inside of dyslexia that are really challenging for Lucy. Mm -hmm. and I was like, those are all, those are all the things that are the most difficult for mm -hmm. me. And so then I had just asked you, I was like, I just, I told you a little bit about some of the areas that I, I struggled mm -hmm. in. And you said like, you know, kind of unofficially, like it sure sounds like you also mm -hmm. have it. Mm -hmm. And that was a fascinating thing in adulthood. So I'm, I was probably 37 at that time. So I had made it through a decent, I had made it through a decent chunk of life without the diagnosis. But having that understanding of that I have dyslexia too, or, or there's a strong chance that I have it, it helped me like think about and process new tasks mm -hmm. in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. It's okay for me to say no to a task that really doesn't make mm -hmm. sense if I can give my time and energy to something that is mm -hmm. more, is maximally mm -hmm. impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and so like having the kind of the freedom and flexibility to say yes to that, I also have a really talented team with mm -hmm. people that are made up with all of these incredible skill mm -hmm. sets that I am not in possession mm -hmm. of. And so like resourcing our team to show their strengths in those areas. And I'm going to, I'm going to go over here and do the thing that comes more naturally to me. And I'm mm -hmm. good at all of that has been so unbelievably valuable. So mm -hmm. even in adulthood, like I would just say, like, if you're sitting there listening right now and you're thinking like, Ooh, yeah, reading, Ooh, and that's one thing I would say. Like, I never thought about dyslexia for me because I love reading. Mm -hmm. Re reading has always come easy to me, mm -hmm. but my dyslexia shows up in, in other kinds of ways. So maybe it isn't you struggle to read as an adult. It could be that, but maybe there's some other things about mm -hmm. how you process information. And mm -hmm. I remember coming out of a really hard class once. Uh, I was in college. It was a new class. It was really complicated. 
And I just sat in the first day and I just, there was something about the conversation that the students were having. I left that class, I was probably a sophomore or junior in college, and I called my mom. And I said, mom, I, I don't know what it is, but I think I'm behind in this class. Not because it's my first day, but they're processing information in a way that I can't or mm-hmm. I am not. Mm-hmm. And so the class itself felt like I was asking her, should I quit this class? Because like, I'm not processing the way that these students mm-hmm. are. And her encouragement, we had no, we had, you know, she wasn't thinking about dyslexia at all, but her encouragement was just like, stick, stick to it. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful mm-hmm. I did because like I was able to learn the content. It just took me, a, mm-hmm. it just took me a different amount of time. But mm-hmm. I, w- I was in college the first time I realized like, oh, there's something that's different about mm-hmm. the way I'm processing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for sure, since then, there have been a number of things where, um, again, I've never thought about dyslexia, but there these realizations that like, man, mm-hmm. I'm not processing this correctly. Mm-hmm. So I would just say to, to, if you're listening, like whether it's reading or how you process information or are you naturally really messy and you, you mm-hmm. the idea of organizing something can be daunting and overwhelming, mm-hmm. you should think about mm-hmm. about that about looking into that. Mm -hmm. Um, There's something really sweet about knowing. Again, Mm -hmm. if you're an adult, it's not going to change a ton about your life, Mm -hmm. but knowing there is for sure a kind of value in knowing Mm -hmm. what do you give your time Mm -hmm. and energy to. And especially teenagers, because they have Mm. this underlying uh, underlying fear. They are not smart enough Mm. and that is not what's going on. Mm. And if you can get that solved, things get better Yeah, because they take things off their you know, possibilities like, yeah, I'm not cut out for that. Mm. Maybe these other smart people, but I can't do that. Mm. And they totally can do it, yeah. but they may have to approach it in a different way. And maybe if that teenager in a diagnosis of dyslexia, they realize, oh, some of these like tactile, hands-on, mm-hmm. building, engineering, mm-hmm. music kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Like I have like a, I actually have kind of an aptitude or, or mm-hmm. a leaning towards that. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe it isn't like, oh, I, I want to do that thing and I need to overcome it. Maybe it's a realization of I actually have, I might have a heads up mm-hmm. uh, in, in something. And that's a, an opportunity to push really hard mm-hmm. into that thing that's maybe just a passion of yours mm-hmm. and you're excited about it, but like, it, how could it possibly be a career? Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe that's the push of like, mm-hmm. you should actually push really hard into that mm-hmm. thing. You might be really, really gifted mm-hmm. in that. Or that you have dyslexia and you're going to be really skilled at things. So keep your options open, mm-hmm. especially when you're younger and you're like, I should try that. Yeah. I might be really fantastic at yeah. this. Sweet. Yeah. At, at one point in the meeting with Lucy, you set, a, you set a piece of paper down and it said, good jobs for people with dyslexia. Mm-hmm. And it was this list of all these things in these different categories. And um, I had started, with the exception of music, I had started a business in all of them. Mm-hmm. With it, but I was a music major in college. And so it just, it was like, oh my word, like this sure feel. It was just like this little confirmation. I think that's when I mm-hmm. chimed in. Like, I think, mm-hmm. I think there, there might be mm-hmm. something here for me. I remember going over a report with a family once and I asked at the end, you know, do you have any questions for me? And the dad and the family said, yeah, where were you when I was yeah. in school? And he is a really successful business person, runs multiple businesses, does very well. Mm-hmm. But he said he spent his K-12 education like counting down the desk, trying to make it sure when it might be his turn to have to read in front of the class mm-hmm. and being so stressed out, not learning the material because he's trying to figure out when it, it might be his turn to read. Mm-hmm. It feels like education around dyslexia Mm -hmm. is I mean new seems like a weird word to say but Mm -hmm. like when I was in school in the 90s like you didn't really hear much Mm -hmm. about it Mm -hmm. what does that kind of timeline look like well we have the Minnesota Read Act has been passed by Governor Walls and it's a great thing and it's really based on the science of reading and it can really be helpful for it's going to be provide uh, training for teachers And you know, with anything, you just have the heart for it. And we can't wait around for these precious kids to really get exactly what they need in Mm -hmm. school. We have to take it in our own hands Mm -hmm. and make sure that these children are getting what they need. School is gonna be helpful, especially with accommodations. And they're doing the best they can with the resources they have and the knowledge they have at the time. But we're gaining, but Minnesota is really on the forefront here Mm -hmm. of getting help to kids. One of the things that has felt really, you know, homeschooled for, mm-hmm. you know, the entirety of our, our kiddos you know, ever since they were really little, but it has felt like a blessing that mm-hmm. having, 
having Lucy being able to have the one-on-one -on -one attention with a with a mom that like knows and understands like that has been that's it's been a, a sweet thing in our life. Yes. You know what would you say to maybe families that like they're in the public school mm -hmm. and they they just don't have the luxury of one-on-one -on -one attention. Mm -hmm. What are some things that parents could do? Um, if they're thinking, ooh, maybe my kid has dyslexia mm -hmm. or they just found out and they are in a public school setting where they're just, the ratios aren't the same as, you know, one-on-one -on -one attention. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, to really learn about dyslexia, there is a really good website um, called Bright Solutions for mm -hmm. Dyslexia. And just know that you as a parent can be the answer for your child. Mm -hmm. You know, at two hours a week and some understanding of mm -hmm. dyslexia, you can get that child mm. exactly what they need and be an advocate but it really I think that when I work with families I'm really looking for those families that want to find solutions I'm not looking for families that want to fight with the district they're right. they're doing the best they can yeah. with what they have mm -hmm. and that's not the route to go in my opinion but to find solutions for our children yeah the energy and time that it takes to mm -hmm. probably have that fight mm -hmm. if you just pivoted a fraction of that time mm -hmm. into maybe some Barton at mm -hmm. home on nights and weekends, mm -hmm. you probably could mm -hmm. uh, be real successful mm -hmm. for your for your kiddo. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the sweet things about like now that Cassie and I know we're like an advocate. Like I'm I'm mm -hmm. like I'm on the hunt when when we've got friends who've got little ones mm -hmm. that are a lot like Lucy was when she was two and three, I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, I can't diagnose you, but I'm just saying you should look into that. Just mm -hmm. you start thinking about that mm -hmm. and being able to advocate for it early mm -hmm. has been really, really sweet. And so like, if you do, if you do get involved with your kiddo, mm -hmm. the, the byproduct is that other people in your life could also really benefit mm -hmm. from your mm -hmm. excitement about mm -hmm. serving your kiddo mm -hmm. in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of homeschool families. I think it's a great environment for students with dyslexia mm -hmm. and can really do an exceptional job and can really give that one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And it's not always available, you know, that's, it's, right. not, a, it's not a situation that's available mm -hmm. all the time, but mm -hmm. it's sweet that with a couple hours a week, you can, mm -hmm. you can be, you mm -hmm. can play a, a really crucial role mm -hmm. in helping mm -hmm. your kiddo. What's the average age of diagnosis? When, when should people really maybe start looking mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. understanding like, oh, maybe mm -hmm. my kiddo isn't reading at that, at right. the right level? Right. How would you spot it? Yeah, I can talk about like in the school system, they're not testing specifically for dyslexia, but they'd be testing for a learning disability. Mm. And dyslexia, if it's severe enough, would fall under that category. But they say third grade is when that is getting identified. And a lot of that has to do with the model that's being used to identify dyslexia. It's called the severe discrepancy model. So they're looking at an IQ score, and then they're looking at a standardized test for achievement. And if the gap is big enough, mm. they're eligible for services. So they're really looking at the gap is big enough that there is this huge difference between what their potential is mm. and what they're achieving. And why third or fourth grade? Because at third and fourth grade, things go to multi-syllable words that mm. what is expected of students really stretches out. Mm. And so that's in like a public school system, that's when kids are getting identified with a learning disability. Mm. But it could be, you know, the range of it. I mean, as like you said, you notice things at age two yeah. when, once you learned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seriously, I think if I knew then what I know now about dyslexia, I think I would have seen in mm -hmm. Lucy at probably two or three. Mm -hmm. I think I would have seen it. Mm -hmm. When I work with families and they're so discouraged of why didn't I see this? Mm -hmm. Why it's, you know, is it too late? It's never too late. And I also talk to them about look at the things that maybe your teenager has learned mm -hmm. along the way. They've learned to keep at it, mm -hmm. to keep working hard, mm -hmm. and things. Even though you put in a lot of lot of effort, mm -hmm. your test results may not be a match, but you still know that you knew that material. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of lessons in work ethic and stick to itness mm. really serve them well in life. If school doesn't beat them down so much yeah. that they can't come out of it the other end, mm -hmm. so there are some lessons that they have learned along the way. So once they can get it identified, then they can get back on that path yeah. of doing what they would like to do with their lives. There is a tenacity that Lucy has. Mm -hmm. It is really, really sweet. At the same, you don't want to get in the way of it because she, you know, she's going she's gonna to figure mm -hmm. it out and she's going to do mm -hmm. it. And it's, it's fun mm -hmm. to watch.
And one of the things in thinking about her career, her future, whatever mm-hmm. that is, like Will, she can she can do whatever she wants to mm-hmm. do. But just as we're even at the age now of nine and just kind of like encouraging, it's mm-hmm. like, okay, I, I know kind of how to like fan that flame a little bit. She loves cooking. Mm-hmm. She loves cooking. She has an aptitude towards it. She mm-hmm. kind of understands the kitchen a little mm-hmm. bit. And um, it's like, okay, well, that would be an incredible career. Mm-hmm. That would be an incredible career for her. And so whatever she wants to do, yeah. go and do it. But I'm kind of like, hey, sweetie, like. And culinary arts is right on that list, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> and it would just, it would be so fun to mm-hmm. like, to, if that's something she really wants to do, rather than squelching that and say like, you should do something with a mm-hmm. book in your hand, just being like, yeah, mm-hmm. let's, let's have you, let's have mm-hmm. you do that. Mm-hmm. Um, her and I were cooking together last night. And if I had a quarter for every time I've had to tell her, you don't use your hand to dish out of the bowl. <laughs> uh, like you just need, you need a spoon. And she's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I, I tell her all the time, don't use your hand, right? And then she, she, she was doing that. She was scooping watermelon last night. She was uh-huh. scooping watermelon out of the bowl with her hand. And then she read, and I just told her, I just told her, don't do that. And then she reached for the, the, the cupboard, the knob, uh-huh. and, and she touched the knob. And I just had to explain, like, this is, this is why. You know, because, like, now there's, now there's watermelon germs, mm-hmm. goo on there. And for watermelon, it's no problem. But for other things, that is kind of a problem. Mm-hmm. And so, like, it's some of those little things mm-hmm. of, like, process and mm-hmm. organization that, like, she's going to have to learn. Mm-hmm. But so much of just, like, the raw aptitude mm-hmm. of, like, what is it like to, like, mm-hmm. be in a kitchen? Mm-hmm. She has all of that in mm-hmm. spades. Mm-hmm. She just needs to learn mm-hmm. some of the little mm-hmm. particular mm-hmm. organization things mm-hmm. inside the kitchen. So mm-hmm. um, I think as we watch the Olympics now and we hear the stories of the Olympians mm-hmm. and how many of them are dyslexic. How many? Do we... What? I don't know what the percentage is, but it's probably more than 15 to 20%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Kinetic awareness and yes. ability and just, to perceive mm-hmm. uh, different things and problem mm-hmm. solve. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fascinating. Isn't it? Well, Miss mm-hmm. Kelly, that's wonderful. I'm so thankful. I'm, I'm thankful that we got to have a really nice conversation about dyslexia. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm thankful for the just the fun little introduction that we've had to you and how not just the diagnosis that was it was great to get that Mm -hmm. um but i have i mean i I send everybody to you uh, anybody that is even remotely interested Mm -hmm. um, or curious i'm sending them to you and the reason why isn't just because you expertly uh diagnosed lucy and me but the way that you handled lucy when we were there um, was so special you were uh encouraging to her you you didn't just see her her value, but like you verbalized it and, and acknowledged it. She would leave there feeling great. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was a treat to kind of Thank walk you. that little journey with you, and so I'm 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 so thankful. And I just want to say, Lucy, if you're listening, because I th- I think you are listening. I just want you to know, Papa's really proud of you, mm-hmm. and the the work you've been doing mm-hmm. is is so good, and uh, it's been really sweet to kind of walk this little journey beside you and with you and. I think the sky is the absolute limit for you, and I'm mm-hmm. I'm proud of you and everything that you're that mm-hmm. you're doing. So, Miss Kelly, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, it is a treat to talk to you, and I would just I would just tell you, it, last little thing, again, if you're at all curious about one of your kiddos, maybe you're you're bumping into the little wall mm-hmm. of reading or mm-hmm. a bedroom that's just really chaotic and they can't seem to figure out how to get it cleaned mm-hmm. and you just have some of those little thoughts of like, mm-hmm. oh, maybe it is dyslexia. Mm-hmm. I would strongly encourage you to mm-hmm. reach out to Miss Kelly. Um, actually, Miss Kelly, we'll, we'll maybe put this in the show notes, but could you just like, where could people find you so that they could maybe get in touch? I give out my personal phone number okay. all the time. Great. So it's 320-249-3050. And I'll take phone calls, mm. and I give an hour of my time to any family that wants to meet with me on their child if I can help point mm-hmm. them in the right direction. That's I'd be really glad sweet. to do it. You could also just reach out, and I'll send you her contact info. But mm-hmm. you've been such a help to our family, and I, I, I know that you um, can be such a help to other people, maybe that are listening right now, too. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Ms. Kelly. We really appreciate it. Thank you.